yeah, so if I'm too loud, let me know. Uh, I also want to apologize ahead of time. This is totally my fault. Uh, my paper is way too long. I misunderstood how long they were supposed to be. And this is a version of uh, something I've given earlier. So uh, I will try to rush through it. I will try not to be too quick, and I'll try to cut what I can. Um, the other thing, too, is I didn't know that I'd be filmed. And so I definitely need to apologize in advance that uh, I'll probably not say when I'm quoting every time that I'm quoting someone. Uh, even the title itself of the paper is an homage to, is it up there? No, it's not. What's the title I gave you? Secrecy, Security, and Democratic Autoimmunity. Uh, that's a homage to Lee Johnson wrote a simpler paper, stuff like that. So I might forget during the course of the, the paper to mention every time I'm quoting somebody. So I hope nobody sues me. Um, so quickly, um, First, I'm going to briefly sketch the security state concept of the panopticon, as originally conceived by Jeremy Bentham. Second, I will relate Michel Foucault's examination of the idea to illustrate a number of power analytics. Third, I will compare this to Jacques Derrida's idea of democratic autoimmunity and how this functions in the relationship between secrecy and transparency in democracy. Using these concepts, I will look at both successful examples of this relationship and unsuccessful ones. I will conclude with some suggestions as to ameliorations to this inherently conflicted and inevitably autoimmune power dynamic. And this is, of course, all in reference to Snowden and Manning and all of these different things that have come out. So the Panopticon. In the 18th century, the utilitarian philosopher Jeremy Bentham came up with an idea as a practical solution to myriad problems of modern society. Bentham proposed a roughly circular structure to be built with an outer shell of cells separated from each other and from the outside. The interior side was open, facing a central tower. Every cell can see the tower, and the tower can see everyone else, although the tower occupants cannot see each other. Uh, sorry, the tower occupants are hidden, as well as the cell occupants cannot see each other. Thus, every single cell occupant is aware of constant and absolute surveillance, regardless of whether anyone is actually in the tower itself. It is important to emphasize that Bentham's intentions were benevolent. Inspired by its simplicity, he remained unaware or unconvinced of its nefarious potential. In the Panopticon, he saw a practical physical solution to plethora of contemporary institutions. While its clearest application is penitentiary, he also saw it as an elegant means of producing efficiency through space. So quoting Bentham, houses of correction, workhouses, manufactories, madhouses, hospitals, schools, the more constantly the persons to be inspected are under the eyes of the persons who should inspect them, the more perfectly will the purpose X of the establishment be attained. Bentham spent his entire life trying to make at least one uh, panoptic structure succeed, but never came to fruition. The panopticon concept plays a profound role in Michel Foucault's work two centuries later as the visual pinnacle for the power analytic inherent in virtually any disciplinary technology or structure. Essential to Foucault is the idea that power relationships are inherent rather than uh, imposed. Power does not assert itself, as it were, from without, as repressive or constitutive, but from within. The sphere within which power operates contains and produces both the ancien regime as well as the resistance against it. So all reactionary elements exist specifically within the sphere of repressive and vice versa. Given that the very idea of revolution occurring outside of a power structure is inconceivable, the structure itself gives rise both to the dominant and the subversion. So Foucault traces the development of discipline and punishment, uh, that is the reduction of subjects or persons to objects for institutional appropriation, in a genealogical fashion. First, punishment originates as a spectacle. Uh, given that all offenses are against the sovereign, be it crown or mitre, uh, the limit of, the bod of that power is uh, Sorry, the limit of power over a body is death, so torture becomes basically the expression of power. The second move is as societies turn towards contractualism, deviance is seen as against society in toto. So punishment diminishes as it also uh, becomes a form of a breach of contract, and deterrence replaces the need for torture. And then third, he says the modern prison completes this reversal. Incarceration produces docile bodies via complete surveillance, and punishment becomes utterly private. No one gets to see it. As Foucault says, discipline does not uh, simply replace other forms of power which exist in society. Rather, it invests or colonizes them, linking them together, extending their hold, honing their efficiency, and above all, making it possible to bring the effect of power to the most minute and distant elements. So whereas traditional power is manifest, disciplinary power is out of sight, right? By turning us into docile bodies, 
uh, discipline makes itself invisible while making everyone in the process radically visible. Accompanying this transition are two metaphysical shifts in the definition of persons themselves. First is the creation of objectifying codices of the most minute documentation. A vast system of categories, classes, details, characterizations is vital for effective implementation of disciplinary technology. Turning persons into systems to be analyzed as opposed to anything like what we would consider a person. And second is the creation of disciplinary spaces. The school, the hospital, the barracks, the factory all follow the prison in coordinating individuals off into efficient spaces in order that these individual bodies may be analyzed as individual units. So the panopticon is therefore less an innovation by Bentham in Foucault's mind than it is a physical manifestation of this advancing disciplinary technology. This is all the more true given that Bentham saw its use far beyond the prison as the controlling of physical space in any social, political, or economic structure which could benefit from such ordering. When one considers the modern uh, surveillance state against this backdrop, Foucault is not just prescient, he's a prophet. Indeed, the massive information panopticon in which we live now, and we're much more aware of, post Snowden, etc., is much more effective qua invisible than the physical spaces proposed by Bentham. And as Foucault proposed, we are conditioned via all other panoptic disciplinary technologies in which we constantly live. All of us grow up in these power analytics that he describes, thereby preparing us from birth to acquiesce to this type of constant surveillance. So moving to Derrida. Um, this inherent mutually creative and destructive nature of power bears a striking similarity to Jacques Derrida's idea of democratic autoimmunity. Derrida takes the often ill-understood physical phenomena of autoimmunity from biology. While the immune system of any body naturally serves to protect it from enemies foreign and domestic, autoimmunity names a condition wherein the same system turns against the body itself. Derrida applies this phenomenon to the body politic. The, the dangers to democracy do not come as external invading bodies. Rather, democracy always contains within itself the alternative to democracy. In other words, the ability to threaten democracy comes in and through the same democracy. Consider the following uncontroversial statement. A democracy qua democracy cannot outlaw any particular political party. However, if, for example, the Nazi party managed to win enough electoral influence, fascism could replace democracy via democracy. But the manner in which democratic autoimmunity mani manifests itself is typically more subtle. In the pre-World War II era, Democratic power produced prior restraint and the Espionage Act as solutions to the growing fear of subversive political ideologies, particularly anarchism. In the post-war and Cold War era, the threat of tyranny in the form of communism led to the production of ideological and practical systems that bore striking similarities to democracies' own enemy, McCarthyism, adding God to numerous nationalistic modes to distinguish us from the godless communist, all sorts of things like this. Uh, in the post-Cold War era, particularly post-9-11, the fear of an animosity towards terrorism, specifically as this is a, a form of ultra-violent political warfare, reducing human beings to instruments to further an ideology. This leads us in the U.S. to produce new systems for defining extrajudicial humans who are not in possession of rights, enemy combatants, new codes regarding what constitutes torture, enhanced interrogation, new forms of warfare used to terrorize, drones, and new forms of surveillance which remove all privacy from our own citizens in an attempt to ensure their security, SIGIN, PRISM, etc., effectively reducing humans to instruments to further an ideology. At each stage, autoimmune regimes produce their own autoimmune forms of resistance, and even subversions of autoimmune regimes and resistances produce their own autoimmune responses in the form of whistleblowers, which is where I want to turn now. I'm going to get a drink really quickly, though, because I am parched. So the security apparatus produces frequent attacks on the US's own security apparatus from within. As those tasked with protecting secrecy, the intelligence community, challenge that secrecy in the name of protecting secrecy. Everybody follow that? The whistleblower becomes this kind of ironic autoimmune response to the autoimmune response within the democracy. <laughs> so this last example requires pause, for it's more complex than the rest. Democracies are bastions of secrecy. We often forget this. 
insofar as this constitutes their specific distinction from totalitarian panoptic regimes. And the idea of secrecy is built into the very survival of the body politic, insofar as this constitutes the necessary intelligence apparatus. Sorry, intelligence apparatus. There are the defenders, uh, they, democracies, are the defenders par excellence of celebrated comp confidential relationships. The priest penitent, the doctor patient, the therapist patient, the attorney client, the journalist informant, the intelligence officer, the spouse, and self-incrimination. We have all of these different structures, legal, social, economic, etc., where we specifically protect privacy. When one combines secrecy at the macro level of government with that of the individual micro level, the defense of secrecy emerges as essential and constitutive to democracy. Yet the same is true of the need for transparency. Access to the government's workings is equally constitutive for democracies as nothing more substantially distinguishes free societies from their totalitarian counterparts. Indeed, in every significant sense, this is the holy charge of the fourth estate, of the media, to provide citizens virtually unimpeded with the information necessary for proper decision making. The whistleblower, however, complicates all of this. She does not fit into any category, partaking of all simultaneously. A defender of transparency and opponent of secrecy, she exists specifically due to her access as a defender of secrecy, who signs an anti-transparency contract with her own government. Further, she hopes that her own identity will remain a secret in order to avoid retaliation. Finally, the revelation itself requires selective secrecy. A whistleblower, by definition, makes some aspects of her access transparent, which she deems in the public's interest, making, everything, making every attempt to keep other aspects secret, thereby reaffirming the very need for the thing that she eschews in her actions. Right? So I have a bunch of examples of these, and I don't know how much time I have or how much time I've been going. Um, but that might be the thing that I could cut. Okay. All right. Well, let me, I'll, I'll try to just, uh, it, it's, it's instructive to remember occasions when our immune system works as well as when it doesn't. There are many examples of minimally damaging and maximally informing interactions between secrecy and transparency. For example, the Pentagon Papers, the 2004 revelation of NSA warrantless wiretapping that happened before as well as through Snowden and the CIA's international network of black sites. I will focus on the third to illustrate a success. In November 2005, Dana Priest of the Washington Post broke a story that the CIA had black sites in foreign countries through illegal bribes and without the knowledge of those countries' central governments, or even our own. That's the really amazing part about this. As a means to interrogate and torture prisoners on foreign soil. In her original piece for which she won a Pulitzer, Priest said, the Washington Post is not publishing the names of Eastern European countries involved in the covert program at the request of senior U.S. officials. They argued that the disclosure might disrupt counterterrorism efforts in those countries and elsewhere and could make them targets of possible terrorist retaliation. Priest later revealed the process that led to the story and its redaction. Through a combination of investigative journalism and as yet unknown uh, intelligence officials, she uncovered names, locations, photographs, a virtual library of top secret materials regarding this program. Recognizing the material sensitivity alongside her duty to reveal it, she and her executive uh, editor, Leonard Downey, contacted the White House. A series of meetings ensued, including ones wherein former Vice President uh, Cheney and President Bush personally asked her not to run the story. She and her editor responded that they could not fold before a nebulous claim of national security but that they would redact parts if and when they were convinced of real dangers. The administration, uh, the administration returned that they, there were credible concerns in Eastern Europe. Uh, innocents might be targeted as a result of revealing the program, even though they themselves were unaware of the program. Priest and Downey agreed only after they had been given a type of ad hoc security clearance. They ran the story, providing the information they deemed useful to the public while withholding that which was deemed unnecessary due both to legitimate potential danger uh, and because such specifics did not add anything to the public's need and ability to respond. Now, ironically, the response was remarkable. First, groups like FAIR and The Guardian called their withholding subservient and enabling. Glenn Greenwald, while praising Priest as a superb act of journalism, said that the Post made its decision specifically, this is a quote, specifically in order to enable a plainly illegal program to continue, as if the Post somehow now was complicit. 
Fair went further, if possible. While conceding that retaliation against innocence was possible and even likely, they still said the Post should have run it. Unless the Post revealed specific locations, the legal challenges and political condemnation necessary to force the disclosure they assumed would be difficult, if not impossible. But the response from the right was equally vociferous. The Post was attacked for uh, damaging national security by public figures, by pundits. Priests faced personal attacks and even threats. The DOJ and Congress investigated she and the Post, whether they had broken laws, etc. A witch hunt ensues, and we've seen this game before. The overall response, however, the response from the US public, was basically apathy. In a moment reminiscent of a 2002 headline from the satire news outlet The Onion, Americans shrug, line up to be fingerprinted. It basically felt like that. True, the IRC, the ICC, the EU, and numerous other groups began investigations alongside dozens of countries looking into their own backyards for unwitting CIA complicity. But the US public really didn't seem to care much. In spite of US apathy and in contrast to these autoimmune responses, priests is an extraordinary example of democratic immune system protecting its body politic. On the one hand, they provide the public with the information required to produce informed debate. An illegal and immoral program was being carried out in their name. Her autoimmune critics from the left failed to explain how it was the fourth estate's duty to reveal specifics or how this would actually help, let alone to call their refusal servile or enabling. On the other hand, they withheld that which could needlessly endanger lives. Her autoimmune critics from the right failed to justify why she should shield an illegal and immoral venture from the body politic in whose name it was created, and certainly not in the basis of potential use. Maximally informing, minimally damaging, Priest definitely earned her Pulitzer. So in the next section, I go into lots of, uh, or sorry, several examples of bad, where we are minimally informing and maximally uh, damaging, or we're not even entirely sure. And uh, I think that basically I should probably just skip that. You sure? All right. What do I want to do? Do you want to hear about Valerie Plame or WikiLeaks? All right, fair enough. Valerie Plame and Raymond Davis were both CIA agents who were outed by reporters. Prima facie violations of the Intelligence Identity Protection Act. The former was revealed by conservative pundit Bob Novak as an act of retaliation against her husband, Joe Wilson who dared to investigate and ultimately debunk the Bush administration's claim that Iraq was obtaining uranium from Africa. Although no one was convicted in the ensuing investigation, the autoimmune damage is undeniable. Our intelligence services lost a celebrated career op. She'd been in the, in the CIA business for decades. Not to mention an unknown number of her assets in a number of theaters in which she operated all over the world. And it did damage to the fourth estate. Judith Miller was thrown in jail for defying a subpoena to reveal her sources, a chilling effect on journalists, to say the least. Somewhat different is the case of Davis. While acting as section chief for all CIA operations in Pakistan, under the guise of a consulate employee, he shot and killed two men in what he claimed was self-defense. President Obama demanded that Davis receive immunity, insisting that he was a diplomat. The New York Times discovered, but kept secret, Davis's identity while the UK-based Guardian published it. And Greenwald even condemned the New York Times for protecting it. In both cases, there are multiple levels of autoimmunity. First, the Intelligence Identity Protection Act makes it illegal for any US citizen to reveal the identity of any intelligence operative. Amazingly, Novak's defense was that he didn't know it, uh, it was secret, and that saved him from prosecution. Equally amazing is Greenwald's indignation that the New York Times was not eager to purposely purposelessly break, uh, break federal law, given his reputation as an accomplished lawyer. Second, the reasons for outing these agents is unjustifiable. Regarding Plame, retaliation is obviously unethical, and infinitely more so for the fourth estate. However, Greenwald called Davis's identity, quote, obviously newsworthy information, end quote, even though the New York Times said, quote, the Obama administration argued that disclosure of his specific job would put his life at risk. Greenwald quipped that this was ridiculous, citing the Guardian's deputy editor uh, as justification for assuming that he would have been safe. So disclosing his ID, uh, CIA identity would not expose him. This is bizarre for several reasons. First, it is not clear 
how it is newsworthy that the President of the United States is preserving and protecting the identity of a U.S. agent in a hostile foreign prison. One hopes that this would always be what the President would do. Second, as Section Chief, Davis was in possession of high-level information, and there is a fathomless distance between people assuming that he was CIA as opposed to the admission by the President of the United States and the publication in the New York Times that he was CIA. If the President did not lie, this is my favorite, or if the Fourth Estate called him on his lie, then he or they would themselves be breaking the law and damaging the United States as a result. In short, both are examples of clear autoimmune responses. Rather than serve any legitimate purpose, the outing of an intelligence officer is a gross misapplication of the Fourth Estate's mandate, regardless of whether it was done by a conservative pundit under a Republican president or a liberal one under a Democrat. In the case of WikiLeaks, I go on for pages because it's just so screwed up. There are lots of problems there. The, in the conclusion, I basically uh, suggest three possible federal reforms and ways to actually address this. One at the legislative level, one at the judiciary, and one at, uh, in the executive. But I really assume we don't have time. So should I stop for questions? or? I don't know how. <laughs> um, OK. I'll just I'll read this last couple of paragraphs. First, the United States needs to create a security ombudsman. This can be illustrated by reference to Snowden, uh, which I have intentionally left unmentioned up to now because it's very complicated. In an interview with NBC's Brian Williams, supplemented with comments from the documentary Citizen Four, Snowden says he exhausted all available channels before leaking his documents. Specifically, he says he sent emails to the NSA's Office of General Counsel to their oversight comp compliance folks not just officially in writing through email, but to my supervisors, to my colleagues, in more than one office. I did it in Fort Meade. I did it in Hawaii. Uh, he says he repeatedly raised objections inside the NSA in writing to its widespread use of surveillance, but he was told, sorry, he said he was told, this is quoting Brian Williams, quoting him, more or less in bureaucratic language, you should stop asking questions. Frustrated, he decided he had no choice but to go to the press. He rejected the idea of going to the New York Times on the basis of the fact that in 2004, they opted to not publish everything about the warrantless wiretapping. Instead, he absconded to Hong Kong, contracted Poitras, who convinced Greenwald, and the rest is history. Apparently, he didn't entirely do his homework. Numerous other options are available. He could have gone to the federal ombudsman located in the OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. He could have contacted domestic Fourth Estate representatives like Priest, who have shown the willingness to speak truth to power in a responsible manner. He could have followed Ellsberg's lead from the Pentagon Papers, and contacted any senator or representative, not only those who are on the relevant committees, but potentially more sympathetic mem members. If he feared retaliation, Congress members can enact legal protection protections for individuals such as private bills, and case law contains precedents for whistleblowers. My point, considering he has always stated that he wanted the story to be about the information, not himself, any of these would have served his purposes better then flight to a foreign nation in possession of almost 2 million pages of stolen classified documents to meet with a self-exiled journalist and seeking asylum from the Chinese, Russian, and Equ uh, Ecuadorian governments, states not known for their respect for journalists, whistleblowers, or transparency in general. Yet, if the US had an ombudsman for such concerned intelligence operatives, which is both shield from, shielded from and can shield from individuals from the chain of command, all of this would be a moot point. Such positions exist in all manner of public and private institutions. The government's intelligence apparatus needs one, too. Second, there need to be shield laws. Uh, it's amazing that there aren't, protecting journalists and their sources. While such protection is proclaimed as among the most august democratic principles, it is currently not enshrined in law. Shield laws should stipulate that the onus needs to be on the government to show that it can and should pursue intelligence leaks rather than the other way around. Uh, because now the Espionage Act just immediately goes into effect. Likewise, laws should be written in such a manner that the journalist has a single point of contact at the highest possible level with, whenever it obtains classified material. Third and related, shield laws should be written in a manner that establishes a federal whistleblower court. This would have to be both agile and strict. Agile so that the judiciary may be provided with access to all the relevant classified information to decide on a case-by-case -case basis regarding whistleblowers, sources, and journalists, but also strict 
as the same judiciary is empowered fully regarding their own decisions, thereby precluded by, uh, from autoimmune responses by other federal agencies. And the 1978 FISA court is both good as a theoretical example of this and terrible as a practical model. Because while it was established as a check on ex executive power in the aftermath of Watergate, it's a secret court for exactly this type of purpose. It was created in recognition of the tendency towards autoimmune excess in the secrecy and transparency relationship. It precludes wiretapping of US citizens and it creates a court which reviews exceptional cases of imminent threats for potential suspension of this protection. A whistleblower court can be created on the same principle, providing a central point for whistleblowers, for journalists, for sources, etc. Like FISA, the default position would be to protect both individuals and the public right to know. Also like FISA, the court would review exceptional cases, providing a clear avenue for both the government and the fourth estate to state their cases in the hope of avoiding these autoimmune power reactions. That's it. What now? All, all the way in the back first. Go ahead. No, no, not red tape. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, that's technically false. I don't, okay, so there are multiple different things going on here. Um, I'll hold on to the Snowden thing for a second. Well, no, let me just answer that first. I, I genuinely do not believe that we live in that world, right? And I know that it is a very kind of easy place for us to go to assume that our government is so nefarious that they would just off an intelligence operative who might be concerned about things. But let's also remember he was either smart enough or secure enough that he was able to abscond to Hong Kong with two million pages of documents but nobody even knowing until he was already there. He'd already tried to contact Greenwald before he left and he'd contacted Poitras. So the whole point is, and furthermore, he talks about speaking to these other supervisors. And I did put a list of things in there, an entire paragraph of other options that he technically had, including Ellsberg, right? I mean, Ellsberg, when, when he couldn't actually get sources to, uh, to publish the Pentagon Papers, he went to a sympathetic representative, I don't remember his name at the moment, on a totally different committee. It was on a, a, a transportation committee. And the, the rep was so pissed off and so in agreement with Ellsberg that he, he uh, um, disclosed 3,000 pages of classified documents into the congressional record that day, right? Which no one could stop him from doing because he is a, you know, a legally you know, elected representative of the people. And suddenly everyone's like, holy shit, this is transportation. Now we're hearing about the Pentagon. What? Um, so the whole point is, is that if he'd done his homework, there were other options and potentially less damaging ones. This is getting back to what I think is, is your real question. The reason that I, I wrote this in the first place and, and became inspired to, to write it and to think about it was there are good examples where we protect both security and transparency with as little damage as possible and still attempt to actually protect the body politic in a, a, a proper immune system type of way. You see what I'm saying? This is why I keep using the body metaphors, where the fourth estate does its job and informs the public, but it need not inform them of extraneous material that could be potentially damaging very often in ways that we cannot uh, potentially know. 
right? If I find out that someone had coffee at 9 a.m. at a certain place from a cable, for example, through WikiLeaks, I might not know that other people might be looking for that person or where that person was, et cetera, et cetera. And it may look completely innocuous and harmless to us, but we, by definition, don't have that access and recognize the need for secrecy in all of these different types of relationships. So the irony to me is when we often will decide that someone is a hero without entirely understanding what has been done or what the avenues are that are open. But at the same time, I'm also agreeing absolutely that our government does not have the shield laws in place. It does not have a, a kind of uh, ombudsman in place for all secret, uh, security agencies. And it absolutely needs a kind of court to deal with this. Does that make sense? Of course. Well, no, and it's obviously compartmentalized. But I mean, the whole point is, is that we all recognize, I mean, immediately that everyone shouldn't have launch codes for nuclear weapons. We all recognize immediately that we should not have the identities of secret CIA operatives. We recognize a lot of these things immediately, right? Or I assume we do. I hope we do. Sure. I don't disagree with that, but I don't know a world in which we can do that with launch codes and CIA operatives and things of that nature. Right? I mean, there still are obviously, in the same way that I was saying before, I mean, democracies must both protect secrecy and transparency. You know, I don't want anyone to ever open source my relationship with my lawyer or whether or not my spouse can, you know, be required to testify against me in court or any of those things. And so that, that was the whole thing, is to kind of try to look at this in a different way from the, the, both the power analytics of Foucault as well as the, um, the autoimmune idea from Derrida I really like, about when the immune system is working correctly and when it's actually hurting itself in the process of trying to protect itself. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's why I was also trying to use those examples where, you know, when we were so worried about the communists, the godless communists, we started to do, you know, things that were against democracy in our attempts to protect ourselves from this, right? Uh, you know, like I said, McCarthyism or, or you know, all, all of these different things that to try to make us in lockstep with this ideology. Uh, and the same thing, the Espionage Act itself was created because of our fear of anarchism even though it's, uh, it itself ended up you know, being used to silence people and being totally anti-democratic. So I, I completely agree. Right. Right, right, right. Well, they weren't just, th this is important too. I mean, FISA um, was broken by the Bush administration thousands of times. And this was all revealed in 2004 and early 2005. And again, the public seemed to not even really care. And that was even different than the programs that Snowden was talking about. Snowden repeatedly um, describes the ability of government to basically obtain all this information the same way that the um, you know, billions of phone calls and everything else. But it was the metadata, it wasn't actual phone calls. The breach that was revealed in 2004 under the Bush administration was clearly, clearly a violation of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, because they were actually recording all of the phone calls. And that was admitted. It came out. But then Congress passed in 2005, 2007, 2000, sorry, 2005, 2006, 2008, 2012. They repeatedly decided to make this legal. 
And even the last one in 2012, they said, and by the way, you don't need to continue updating us in Congress. That was part of the law, right? And th this is utterly ridiculous. This is exactly, this is the real problem, I think, is that A, we are so either unaware or apathetic, right, when it comes to these things, or when it becomes technical, we suddenly shut down, right? That we don't even realize that we elected people to then give them as much power as they wanted to take at the NSA. So I think there are two problems here. One is that the irony of the public that it didn't know that Congress already, sorry, that the NSA already had this power, right? Suddenly Snowden reveals it, and it reminds me so much of Captain Renault. Now everyone's shocked, shocked that this is happening, right? Even though we've been told in legislation five different times that they were going to do this if they wanted to. Well, and the other problem is, is that when Congress actually um, washes its hands of even needing to communicate with the NSA, that is a clear violation of any kind of democratic principle. Right? You cannot have an, an entity acting on its own without oversight. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I just saw a, a, yeah, a Pew study uh, came out in March or February, and it asked the general public if they thought that it would even be possible for their, their future internet surfing and stuff to be secret. And I think only 40% of people said yes. It was definitely less than half. That have, have, they just completely, again, shrug, line up, fingerprint, whatever. What's next? Yeah, right. Just right here, here, whatever. I completely agree with that. Yeah. I think I think that that is part of the problem of the apathy is that so many people themselves I, if I understand your point like they recognize that you know my internet searches are not that interesting. And so if the government happens to be, you know, looking at those alongside of everything else but they're looking for the bad guys People tend to be really upset about their privacy being invaded, but it's interesting how they don't really get that upset. You know, uh, I don't know if anybody saw John Oliver's interview on last week tonight with Edward Snowden. Um, it was, I think, honestly, I've, I've read hundreds of articles and seen every every interview yet. It was the best treatment I have seen of the entire situation because Oliver reduced it to the point where people in the United States would understand. He said, would you care if the government knew that you were sending a dick pic to your girlfriend? And suddenly, everyone that he interviewed in you know, New York was suddenly very upset. Whereas then he asked them, do you know who Edward Snowden is? No one had a clue, right? Or some people thought he was the WikiLeaks guy. Or some people you know, had just genuinely no idea at all. And they asked him, you know, when he asked about all the collecting metadata and all this stuff, and they're like, I don't, they're, they're catching the bad guys, whatever. But then it's like, your penis. The government's going to have a picture of your penis. And then suddenly everyone's like, no, that, I don't want that. That's bad. <laughs> Which Oliver, sadly, was just doing a commentary on us and how ridiculous we are that you have to put it at this level. Like you said, no one watches C-SPAN, but what? My penis? Oh, my God. Now you have my attention. So, no, I think that all of this is terrible. Uh, and I certainly, I, my, my hope here genuinely is that the public would care more and therefore require these types of reforms or, or other types of reforms. I'm open to suggestions, absolutely. But they could never use it. I mean, the whole point is, is that if any of that ends up getting published, or you, I mean, blackmail is a very complicated thing. Um, I, I don't think, again, I don't think we live in this dystopian future that we often, um, that is often portrayed, right? I, I still have actual hope and faith in democracy, even though it's very slow. Yeah? Do I still have time? Yeah?
Which, by the way, I'm not saying that that means the NSA therefore should be able to collect it. Um, absolutely. And by the way, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, when I, I gave a version of this in information ethics conference, and I was talking to some people who actually work in data and stuff like that, and one of the things that we, we kind of brought out through the, the conferences, sadly, private corporations already do this to us. They collect all of this metadata anyway, and there's absolutely no laws at all or even an attempt by the public to care, right? I mean. The public is, is dimly aware of the fact that every time they do a Google search, that is recorded and that data is collected. And that's why, you know, when you're on Facebook, you're going to get certain underwear ads or whatever it is on the side that is, you know, specifically targeting you. The colossal irony is, is that, again, we just kind of roll over for the corporate response as opposed to when we find out that the government is doing it, we get horribly angry again, like Captain Renault. We're shocked that this is happening, even though it's been happening forever. And so to a certain extent, that relationship as well is very confusing and interesting to me. Why the public, I think it might be partially that we actually think that maybe if we get outraged at the government, they will change because we still dimly believe in democracy. Where somehow we think the corporations are completely out of our control and they're just these, you know, uber powerful entities that we can't make, we can't make them do anything anyway. Sure, sure. No, and the Supreme Court even just said that it that it's legal. So, yeah. Sure. It's a service. Right. Right, and then the corporations get to use it, however, to try to, you know, collect our metadata and manipulate our consumerism and all that stuff. But if the government does it, then it's bad. Oh, no, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I'm just saying it's interesting that the, the public seems to have a totally different relationship to corporations collecting their metadata versus the government collecting their metadata, or the, the government collecting the metadata through the corporations. 